an event to everyone, and he's excited to share it with you. Littlepassports.com. He must be 18 years or older to order. week so far? Yeah. Good, good. So we're on the last one for this set session of everything you need. I have an idea of what I'm going to do for next Wednesday. Um, and then after that, Nelson should do the, the two Wednesdays after that because I won't be here. So hopefully he'll be able to make it. If not, I know with Brother Roger, y'all be able to wing it, but I'll let him know hopefully if I find out something but as of right now Brother Nelson's supposed to do something those two Wednesdays the 15th and the 22nd <laughs> that's the book <laughs> but uh but yeah we're gonna um I'm look I don't hopefully I can do what I want to do for next Wednesday but we'll see because I already read everything over it it's just a lot of information I'm trying to figure out how to put it into a PowerPoint to make it one night instead of having to break it up but but we'll see if not we'll do something and then when i come back from vacation we'll uh start the new one by max Lakato. i got it in but i cannot remember what the name of it is it's brand new and then i got one from jim Simbala, which is the one that we've done the pastor at the brooklyn tabernacle choir he um he's got a new one too and his looks pretty neat so i got two more to go after that but this one we're in the last session, which is session six, reach the destination. Those who walk with God will always reach their destination. Always remember that. As long as you are walking with God. So in this last one, it says, it is exhilarating to finally reach a destination that you have been pursuing or working to reach. Whether it took hours, days, or even weeks, the journey suddenly seems worthwhile as you enjoy the sense of accomplishment that comes from achieving a goal. There may also be a sense of personal satisfaction in knowing that you were able to not only persevere but also help others along the way. Little in life is more fulfilling than knowing that because of your kindness, others are able to enjoy the same sense of achievement. While you're ultimately Looking for the heavenly destination that's still ahead of you, your journey of faith also provides some exciting milestones along the way. There is something stimulating to know that in spite of all the obstacles, setbacks, and temporary struggles you endured, you persevered. Your, your perseverance and reliance on God's resources has enabled you to reach your destination. For the believer in Christ, that destination can be summed up by Peter's instructions to add to brotherly or to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity which is also love just as god has put people in your life who will show you love and encouragement he has also put into other people's lives so that you can show them love and encouragement he's put you in their lives is what it says jesus proclaimed that the greatest commandment was to love the lord your god with all your heart and the second was to love your neighbor as yourself the type of love to which Jesus was referring was not a simple exchange of pleasantries or even feelings of affection. Rather, he was speaking of a self-sacrificing love, a love that motivates you to give everything to God and others. Jesus calls you to give your all to others, including the difficult ones, and put their needs above your own. One by one, we have passed all the milestones on the trail and have come to this final quality. All of the character traits that we have discussed have been building on each other to reach this ultimate destination. So as you rely on all the tools that God has provided for you, which was diligence, virtue, knowledge, temperance, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity, they will guide you forward and they will lead you into the abundant life that God has planned 
for you. So when we look at love, uh, this battery thingy. Love is the spiritual journey, and it's the unlearning of fear and the acceptance of love. So when we look at what, remember this is where we started. We started in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. But at the very end, if you notice what it says, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity, which is known as love. Charity is also kindness and tolerance and judging others. But you got to look at what verse 8 says. It says, for if these be in you, one, they have to be in you. And then the second part, and abound. A lot of people are like, hey, I love somebody. Well, what are you doing about it? You know, you just can't, well, I have it. Well, you got to do something with it. It's got to abound in you. They will make you that you neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his own sins. We got to make sure that those qualities that we've been going through, which was uh, diligence, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, we got to make sure that they abound in us. So thinking about love, how do you respond to the idea of self-sacrificing love being the destination for a believer in Christ? That's your destination is love. How, how does that, I mean, how do you respond to that idea? We love because he first loved us. Right. Love and, one another no matter what they do to you. And if you think about it, when you study the life of Jesus, it was all about love. Loving somebody else and serving. That's what his whole thing was. And as wise reaching this place, a lifelong endeavor that you ain't going to do it overnight. Because where the test comes is those that seem unlovable. Those are the hard ones. That's when you want to hug them with a chokehold, you know, with a swift knee. <laughs> you can't do that, but you got to love them. Remember, those are, the, those are the things that we've been working towards. You know, and they all end up, if you notice where it started, and then it kept saying, add to this, add to that, add to that. At the very end, it's love. So which is currently the most challenging for you out of those? I know some of y'all self-control or temperance. Because I've heard y'all stories about driving. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure that that's probably where some people are stuck at. Um... Then you got, sometimes perseverance gets hard. You know, we want to quit when things get rough, when things get hard. And we know that we're not supposed to. We're supposed to persevere and get through it. Anybody? Anybody want to be honest and say what they, you don't have to, but it's up to you. Well, I'm having trouble right now, um, being charitable to some people that are judging other people. And I don't know what to say. I, I don't know. I, I'm a softie. I don't like people to be mad at me. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know what to say or how to say it to these people that you have no right to judge this person or people because they have a disability and they're not as they're not the same as you and that's what I'm really nice to the two that are being judged mm -hmm. and it really upsets me that the others are doing this and so I don't know how to express myself very good have to be careful because the Bible says if we judge somebody and then it'd be turned back on us seven times harder. Right, right. And what I recall, I always use the illustration is I didn't die on the cross for you, so I don't have a right to judge you. And we're all created in the image of God, so we're all equal. In God's eyes, every one of us are equal. He's not a respecter of person, so he's not going to put this one over this one or love this one more than this one. We got to realize that, that we're all the same. 
And just because one thinks they're better than the other, you're really, really not. <laughs> and uh, what we do to somebody else, we're doing unto God. So that's another thing I tell people. you got to be careful, especially if you claim to be a child of God. It's easy to do. We, we all get caught up in it at some point in our lives because uh, some people push us to that point. But mm -hmm. that's where we got to get to that, what is it, the self-control, the godliness. It's, it's tough. But remember what it says. If we have all those in us and they abound, we're going to be fruitful. You know, we're not going to be without any things. So at what point right now would you say that some of you are at? Are you almost to the charity part? Or some of y'all still stuck on the first one? <laughs> i got to be diligent in what God's told me to do. Anybody? You are quiet tonight. <laughs> this, you'll, you'll, when we watch the video here in a second, you're going to see um, David Jeremiah talk about Everybody always knows 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is known as the love chapter. He, said, he believes that this one is the love chapter. Because, and I'm going to read it to you, and when I start reading it, you're going to realize what it is. It's the greatest example of love, I believe, other than Christ dying on the cross for us in the Bible. And I think this one, I agree with him, I think it does outweigh the love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13. But listen to what it says in the first five verses. And like I said, you're going to know what it is here in a second. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper, and laid aside his garments, and took a towel, and girded himself. And that he poured, or after that he poured water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. And in verse 12, it says, So after he had washed their feet, he had taken his garments, and was set down again, and said unto them, Know ye what I have done unto you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that ye should do as I have done to you. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye, if you do them. So what do you get from that portion of scriptures that I read? What's the love part? What's the main part? There was a name mentioned. Judas Iscariot. He uh, betrayed Jesus, but he still, Jesus still loved him and washed his feet. And washed his feet. So he washed the feet of somebody that betrayed him. Tell me that's not love. That's how we show love is to people that don't want it or deserve it. And it's hard. It is really, really hard to do. Some you should want to. Huh? Some I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I don't understand. Peter was always, why did he just not like? I, it was funny because I was listening to it on the way. Was it on the way here or this morning on the way to work? They were talking about this, about where Jesus talked about um they were asking him, who's going to betray you? Who's going to do this? And he said, it's the one that I dip the bread in this and hand it to him. And he does it to Judas. And then he tells Judas, what you're going to do, go do now. He says, I bet you one of all them disciples were probably wondering, was he sending Judas off to get more bread? Or was it nobody, the disciples didn't know. I don't, they didn't comprehend and understand what Jesus was saying. And I, I found that kind of interesting because I think if they knew, that Judas was fixing to betray him, they wouldn't have let him go. I think Peter and them, they would have held him. You know, because Peter was quick to cut the ear off of one of the soldiers. You know, and they all just stood around not understanding what was going on. But Jesus knew, and he washed their feet. And then, not only that, 
But when he betrayed him with the kiss, they call it, he called him a friend. He still called Judas a friend. So that, that has a lot too. So what does this say about the types of people whom he expects us to love? The ones that are unlovable. And that's, that's hard. Because you're not going to do that on your own. You're going to have to have the Holy Spirit to help you or you will not do it. I'm just going to tell you that flat out. No matter how much you try. I mean, we might not agree with people or like what they do, but we still have to look past that and love them. I mean, we're not God either. But we got to strive to try to be like him. So what acts of service has someone done for you lately that demonstrated their love or... What have you done to demonstrate your love to someone else? Anybody? Ain't nobody been nice to any of y'all, and y'all ain't being nice to nobody. Wow. Well, I get kind of aggravated at work because <clears throat> I show my officers all the time how to do stuff, or I tell them, you know, you need to contact this person to figure that to do, you know, because I there's some things that records can't handle for them. You know, they're like a different system than us, blah, blah, blah. And so I get really aggravated like the fifth time and the tenth time that they come ask me the same question and they know how to do it already. It gets really aggravating because it just seems like instead of them trying to figure it out and remember how to do it, they just want somebody else to, take, to handle it for them. Even though it's not something that I should get involved with. And so today, because I've been kind of stubborn, this officer had a report out from the beginning of October that was not getting approved because all he had to do was, was mark out one box. And I kept telling them, you need to go into the report, take this out, because I can't do it. I don't work on the officer's side of reports. I only work on ours. I can't do it for him. And so it was just super aggravating. And so now it's December 1st and it's two months later that this report's still sitting in there because he doesn't want to figure out how to do it. <laughs> and it, like I said, it just gets super, super aggravating at work. So finally I told him he, he came into work today and I said, let me know when you have a few minutes. I'll take you back there and I will show you exactly what you need to do. Well, I'm done with that. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to fix it. I said, you can't just leave a report and the computer not fixed. They're just, you just can't do that. So he's like, okay. So he finally had a few minutes and he's one of our new officers that he's been there about a year now and long enough to know, but at the same time. And he really, He's Spanish speaking and he really doesn't understand a whole lot of, he understands English perfectly, but he doesn't understand sometimes when you're trying to explain certain things because he just, if, if it's written down, it's harder for him to understand it. And I didn't know that for him. So when, when they're giving him directions and everything, he just couldn't figure out how to fix it on his own. And that's all it was, was just to delete one box. So I was like, okay, I'm just gonna take him back there, show him how to fix it and be done with it. Because I mean, even his sergeant was just, I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna worry about that report. And I'm like, that's not an option. So whenever I helped him and it, you know, the, the report went through and everything and he's like, Michelle, you know, you helped me so much. You just, you're always so helpful and everything. You know, and it kind of makes you feel that big. <laughs> but God loves us, and he helps us through it, and we get through it. So it's just one of those things that as long as we do our part, do you think? <laughs> God's going to be able to do his part. But we have to come to the point of, are we able to swallow our pride? and put ourselves down to their level, you know? And it's not necessarily down to their level of sin or if they're doing something, not, that's not what it is, but down to their level where you can 
come to an understanding, you know, of who that person is and how they are to a point. Don't let it like steer you wrong. Don't let it take you away from your, your ethics, your morals, what you know, what's right and what's wrong. But at the same point, until you, it's like that old saying, until you walk a mile in somebody's shoes, you really can't say nothing because you don't know what it is. Um, and it is tough. Um, I remember times when I was on the road and you have somebody cursing you out and then at the very end they're thanking you. I mean, it, it, it's tough. I mean, because you got to learn to, what is that, self-control, temperance? <laughs> In order to get to the love part, you have to be able to control yourself because a lot of times we're gonna, we want to tell people exactly what we think, how we feel, and let it go. And... I've been learning a lot lately in my own life with some things. I just stay to myself a lot around people and there's a reason. Because if not, I might say something that I'm gonna have to apologize later. And it's just one of those things that God will get you through it. It ain't gonna be easy though, he's gonna teach you a lesson while he's getting you through it. And as long as you realize that, then, but anybody else, anybody else have anything where Somebody's done something for you, or you've done something for somebody else. Yesterday, I had a doctor's appointment with a VA. They mail you a card, give you a date to go for blood work, and then go meet them. A physician. Well, I, I have a physician that's assigned to me, named Flores. So when I got the card, it had a different doctor's name on it, Lopez. Which, I went out there, I was first in line at the door, I stood out there while I was cool, and waited 20 minutes, and the line gathered up behind me. So, I give the lady my ID card, I went in and sit down, and a few minutes later, the lady come to the door there, and called my name, I got up and walked up there. She says, we don't have an order for you. And I said, well, let me say, well, you will get one. You might take about 30 minutes to get one. So I went back and sat down. I called my wife. She said, I can trust you. And told her, she said, what was going on? It was going to be a little while. So I waited half an hour, maybe about 45 minutes. The lady came back out there. She says, uh, Dr. Flores isn't here. He's been assigned to Lake Nona, the boss. So they called him up there. I said, well, it's not Dr. Flores' name that's on this card for me to come and see. I said, I have no idea who this Dr. Lopez is. She said, oh, that's that lady going right back there. I said, well, I've been sitting here for 45 minutes. Y'all mailed me a card about to lose my cool. <laughs> I've been sitting here, and somebody's not doing their job. When she told me that was that lady going back, I, I had no beef with her. But she hadn't put an order in, really, for the blood work and for me to come and see it. I said, well, am I going to get the blood work done? I said, well, don't y'all just do blood work and straighten out your paperwork. And she said, well, sit down. It might be a few more minutes. <laughs> and she said, well, Dr. Lopez went ahead and wrote an order. So then she had me back there, and I had to tell me blood work, and I come out. And like I say, I was about to lose my cool with all of it. And I kept it and I said, I'll see y'all next Tuesday on the 7th. I walked out the door. The lady took my car and said, hey, there's a bunch of dumb people in here, aren't they? I said, I got to agree with you. <laughs> and, uh, she was a, a, a guard, a, a security officer. And I, I left. Well, I got a phone call today. Said, uh, don't come up for your appointment. Said, well, 
whether you do it televised or by telephone <laughs> due to COVID. I said, all right, that's what I'll do. I said, call me on the phone. Now, how in the world can they tell you where you're sick or something's wrong with you or you get medicine or what? On the telephone. What's the world coming to? I mean, I got mad. I, I like to lost my tool and they probably wanted to put me in jail, but I'd like to tell them all. <laughs> That's why they didn't want you to come back up there. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say nothing out of the way to it. Oh, I know. I wanted right. to. It, it just goes that people can really agitate you. Mm -hmm. I was watching that when I went to my daughter's yesterday. There's four ladies now. There was four, but three sitting at the thing. And you have to sign a board first, then sit down, then they call you. Well, there's no, there's one guy up at the counter. The other two are just sitting there talking back and forth. And this one person goes up and they're like, oh, no, you got to sign. They go, yeah, I've been sitting there. Well, we're busy. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going. <laughs> so I just sat there and I was like, this is why I come early on purpose. Because I know it takes forever for them to get you back. And they're like, well, and the lady was just really rude, the worker, very rude towards the patient. And I'm just like, wow, <laughs> no wonder people go off. The, it's just all in how you talk that, mm -hmm. that people don't realize this right here is the hardest thing for us to control. It is. And uh, I mean, before y'all got here, we got a phone call from the company that we did those scorecard things on for the golf course. And. Never told me it was a two-year agreement that we signed. Never told me that, or we would have never done it. Because it was $375 a year. And I said, this lady called me, and I didn't want to answer it because it didn't say scam. So I answered it, and she knew my name and everything. I said, who are you? And she tells me. I was like, okay. She goes, well, is this the card I'm going to charge? She gave me the number. I'm like, no, ma'am, that card's no good. Well, what's the card? I said, I'm not giving you a card. And she got very rude with me on the phone before any of y'all got here. And I'm like, I'm sitting here going, man, the guy that sold me this never told me it was a two-year contract. If they would have, we would have never done it. I was like, we're not going to do that. Well, why not? And I explained to her, I says, well, we don't have the money. And nobody's come from that area to visit my church. I said, so why should I put more money into something that nobody's coming to, to do? And she was just like, well, sir, it's a two-year agreement. You're going to have to pay it. And I'm going to call you back in four days. I said, okay, click. I'm like, well, an Arizona number that comes up on my phone, I'm not answering it. So I go back and look at the contract on my phone, and there's nothing in there showing a, a time period. So I tried to call back. Well, I get one lady that sends me to another lady, and the second lady that I get, I'm talking to her and telling her, she goes, well, yes, sir, it does say um, that you had a two-year contract. And I'm like, well, ma'am, I was never told that. She goes, well, I'll just cancel you. She goes, I'll just wave it and cancel you, no worries. And I sat there for a second, didn't know how to answer it. I'm like, I wish I would have had the name of the first lady that I spoke to yeah. that called me because I don't understand why she was so rude. And I said, I said, ma'am, I was fixing to not be a pastor on the phone and switch hats. And I was like, because she was very rude to me. I mean, really rude, like forceful, like you're going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I'm like, I'm on a phone and I can push this in button very quickly. But the lady took it and I'm like, it's all in. You just sit and wait. And like I said, I call back. Ladies, like, take care of it. Mm -hmm. Some people, and, and the thing is, too, you don't know what kind of day they're having. You don't know what kind of life they're living. You don't know. And I know it's no excuse, but people do lash out because of things that they're dealing with personally or at their house or at their work. And we got to look at that, too. But then there's just people out there that are just so evil. And those are the ones that God puts in our path to try us. And we've got to get through it. And when we do, God blesses you in the end. I like this thing I put on here. That even a snail will eventually reach its destination. So we got to keep going. Don't quit. Don't stop. Because we're going to make it. You might be going through some trying times to get there. But you got to get there. And it will happen, I promise you. I like this video because it shows you where the guy was trying to go to the whole time. I'm like, man, I would love to go there. That's pretty. <laughs> but that's all the way in Colorado, and I don't fly, so. And that's a long drive. I ain't doing that either.
average heart we're exposed to. The life of faith God calls you to walk is never easy. The path ahead can seem daunting. The world around you can appear dark and dangerous. But the Apostle Peter wanted you to know in the passage we have been studying that regardless of what you face, God has given you everything you need for life and godliness. As you rely on the tools he has provided, diligence, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, and brotherly kindness, they will guide you forward and lead you into the abundant life God has planned for you. Yes, your journey will require you to navigate many challenges, much like the hiker in our story has had to navigate many obstacles on his journey to Lone Eagle Peak. However, as we saw in the last session, the good news is that you don't travel this trail alone. God has put other people in your life to help you along the way. And of course, this means that God has also put you into other people's lives so you can help them along the trail that lies ahead. The hiker in our story is finding this to be true. His traveling companion had already stopped several times to remove rocks from his shoes and take a break. He constantly questioned whether they were on the right path and how much longer it would take to get there. The hiker found his attitude aggravating. Wasn't it the young man's own lack of preparation that had caused his problems? Shouldn't he just be grateful and maybe just be quiet? But as the hiker walked the trail listening to the complaints, he began to reflect on Jesus' words to love the Lord your God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself. And the type of love Jesus intended was a self-sacrificing love, a love that motivated a person to give his all to God and others. So instead of responding, he just listened. And as they rounded the last bend and beheld the full splendor of the lone Eagle Peak, he smiled, took out his phone and offered to let his young companion be in the first photo they took at the final destination. God has called you to live not only for him, but also for those he has placed in your world, including the difficult ones. He calls you to give your all to them and put their needs above your own. This is the destination we have reached in this final session. One by one, we have passed all the milestones on the trail and come to the final quality we are to pursue. In the words of Peter, we are to add to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Is the final quality on Peter's list because it is the most important one that we can possess. It completes and gives meaning to the rest. And even if we were to cultivate all the character qualities we have explored and mastered them, they would be meaningless if they weren't saturated with love. Love is our deepest need and our highest blessing. We often call 1 Corinthians 13 the love chapter in the Bible because it contains one of the most detailed teachings on what godly love looks like and how it should compel us to act. But I would argue that John 13 is the love chapter of the Gospels. It contains an astounding act of service from Jesus 
and one of his most powerful teachings on love. In fact, it reveals five insights about love that show how our lives are better when we experience it and share it with others. The first insight is that love helps us navigate our lifelong journey. For three years, Jesus had led his disciples. He had put up with their squabbling, their outbursts, and their mistakes. He nurtured their hearts and taught them the greatest truths the world has ever heard. And now it was time for him to die, rise again, and ascend to heaven. Yet even in these final moments, as he gathered with his disciples in an upper room one last time to celebrate Passover, we find his love for them endured to the end. It never faltered or failed. John writes, When Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus loved them to the end, in spite of their faults. And likewise, Jesus loves us to the end in spite of our faults. He puts up with our squabbling, our outbursts, and our mistakes. His love is patient, always nudging us toward maturity. His love enables us to navigate the twists and turns of this path we call life to the very end. The second insight about love is that it motivates us to serve others. John states, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. These words should startle us. Can you imagine Jesus on his knees, clad in a towel, stripped like a servant? Can you picture him scrubbing each of the disciples' feet, wiping away the mud and grime they had accumulated from walking the dusty trails of Judea? It was a profound foreshadowing of the incredible act of love and sacrifice Jesus would offer just a day later when he was crucified on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. The love of God exists in this world and it's the only thing that really motivates genuine goodness on this planet. As Paul says, Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. The third insight is that love imitates the Lord Jesus. After washing the disciples' feet, Jesus said, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Jesus commanded his disciples to follow his example of self-sacrificial love. And he's commanded the same of us. As I think about this, I recall the story of a pizza store near Pittsburgh that delivered prescriptions to elderly residents during one especially cold winter. When the word got out, people across the city started calling to arrange for their medications. And no, they didn't have to order a pizza. There were no strings attached. The owner told local media outlets, you have to be there for your residents. Six times in the upper room, Jesus used the phrase, one another. Even when an arctic chill has blown into one of our relationships, we are to rededicate ourselves to loving that person. When God's love flows into our lives, it empowers us to extend that same love to others. The fourth insight is that love elevates the experience of life. There is a special benefit that comes from growing in the love of Jesus, a true blessing. We know this because Jesus said, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. We might have expected him to say, if you know these things, others will be blessed when you do them. Meaning, if you serve others, they'll be blessed. 
But Jesus said, blessed are you if you do this. The truth is that we cannot share the love of Jesus without being blessed in the process. Every time the current of Jesus' love flows through us, we will feel and experience the blessing of godly love. His love elevates the experience of life. This brings us to the climax of Jesus' teaching. He said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus made it clear that love authenticates our discipleship. Notice his emphasis on a new commandment. The old commandment was to love our neighbors as ourselves. Now Jesus was saying that we should love others in the same way that he has loved us. And John would later write, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now we know this is an unreachable standard in our own power, but remember, God has given us everything we need to love in this way. Packed with his power and promises, we can learn to live our lives for the good of others. And when we do, the world will notice. We have now come to the end of our study of the eight character qualities in Peter's list. But that is not the end of what Peter wants to say to us. He ends by giving a list of seven blessings that flow into our lives like a cool mountain stream when we put these teachings into practice. First blessing is godly maturity. Peter wrote, For if these things are yours and abound, by these things he was referring to the eight characteristics. When those abound, they become integrated into our personality like veins of gold and granite. They produce a rock-like maturity. The second blessing is a growing productivity. Peter wrote, For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. In other words, if we possess these qualities and grow in them, we will be effective in what we do for Christ. The key to productivity is the diligent development of godly character. As God develops us into mature believers, he will work through us so that we can bless others. The third blessing is greater clarity. Peter wrote, For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness. As we grow in the grace of Jesus, our vision becomes clear. We see his blessings more quickly. We focus not on the things of this world, but on things that are eternal. The fourth blessing is a grateful memory. Peter states, he who lacks these things has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. If we grow in the qualities we have studied, we will never forget how Christ has forgiven our sins. We will keep Calvary in mind, always remembering how Jesus rescued, restored, and blessed us. The fifth blessing is genuine stability. Peter wrote, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. As we grow in Christ, we will become more emotionally stable, spiritually sturdy, and solid in our beliefs and behaviors. We will confirm our faith by our faithfulness, which brings stability to our lives. The sixth blessing is guaranteed security. Peter said, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. Could he have been more emphatic? If we keep growing in these eight qualities, we will never stumble. This doesn't mean we won't sin or make mistakes. It just means we do not have to worry about whether we're going to heaven. If we are actively pursuing a godly life, our progress in the faith will serve as reassurance of our salvation. And the final blessing is glorious eternity. Peter states, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Peter isn't suggesting we get into heaven by building character. Instead, he is saying that if we diligently add these qualities to our lives, we will be given a rich and abundant entrance into eternity. In the end, I believe you will find that while there are going to be obstacles in the trail ahead, 
The qualities you need to navigate every difficulty, distraction, and delay are available in abundance. And the only question is whether you, like the intrepid hiker in our story, will choose to use these tools God has provided on your journey. Will you recognize the Lord as your guide and receive the power that he has promised to provide? Jesus gave everything he had so you could have everything you need to lead the life God wants you to live. So today, I urge you to accept the challenge he has set before you. Pick up the tools of virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love, and then put them into action. As you do, you will truly find that God has given you everything you need to lead a life in which you can be blessed in every imaginable way. So why is love so important in exercising the other attributes that Peter listed? Why is that one so important? You think you could have faith without love? Could you love without godliness? You gotta have love to do it all. There gotta be a reason. So how did Jesus' love for his disciples enhance the three years that he spent with them? Maybe that was the reason that they didn't go after Judas. Could have been. He got to know him. Yeah. yeah. He tolerated all the things they had done. Yeah. yeah. Just like he does with us today. Think about that. He only had 12 disciples in the flesh while he was here. Now look at all he has now. All the squabbles within churches and amongst churches and his people. And so you think about it. Saved and unsaved are all his people. They're all created by him, for him. So how was this? How was this symbolized by Jesus' act of washing their feet? Showing that he was no better than they were. Humbled himself. Got low. You know, got down below their level, basically. That was a very significant thing back in those days of washing feet. Because you got to remember, everywhere they went, they walked. They didn't have socks, you know, and when they went into houses, that was the first thing a lot of times that they did. And a lot of the houses had servants that would do that. You know, what the people of the house, if they were like of any kind of stature or money or anything, they had a servant that would do that. So what did Jesus do? He took on the form of a servant to do that. So how does Jesus' example of sacrificial love, both in washing the feet and dying on the cross motivate you to serve others. How does it motivate you? He persevered. He went through it. He was finished. He finished his race. So we got to finish ours to go see him. We thank him for what he did for us. And don't judge people so. No. Love them anyway. Sometimes you might have to love them from afar, but still love them. Pray for them. I mean, because there's been, every one of us can sit here and name people in our lives that have hurt us, that have stabbed us in the back, might even be doing it right now. Still got to love them. Got to let it go. You know, they don't control you. You control you. Only you can control what you do or say or think. You know, and it's like I've always said that if we 
don't let it go, then God has to take care of us before he can fix them. And if we learn to just let it go, then God takes care of them. Because he's already said vengeance is his. So with Jesus as your role model, what are some ways that you are sacrificially loving and serving others right now? I mean, what, what are some ways that you're doing it right now? I'm not swinging my dart. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Sometimes silence is golden. You know, just smile and walk away. She's funny. She's sixty years old. <laughs> yeah, she's my baby. How has serving humbly and sacrificially like Christ enhanced your life experiences? I know when I do something for somebody, whether they know it or not, they you feel good. good. Yeah, you yeah. feel good about it. Especially when you're not doing it to get anything in return. You know, that's the one thing we got to realize. Yes, I mean, he, had, he had, had his car jumped off, he left the lights on, and he was somewhere, I think at Publix, and this lady um, from uh, Mary Maid Cleaner, her car wouldn't start, so she asked Brady to jump her car off. And he said, I'm sorry, I can't because I'm afraid mine won't start. And that bothered him. That he, when they got home, he called the Mary Maids and told them about that woman and that her car wouldn't start. And he felt so bad about leaving her there. They sent somebody from Mary Maids to go see about her and to get her car fixed. And they called him back. Hmm. And that bothered him so bad, leaving her stranded there in that car in that parking lot. Hmm. I was going... I was actually working and I had to do something uh, for my supervisor off campus and then I had to stop at CVS real quick to get something and when I come back out, my patrol car wouldn't start. And I'm like, okay, it started up fine earlier and I'm sitting there, so I get on the radio to ask for a deputy to come out and everybody's busy. I already got the hood up and I'm like, man. And I see this elderly Asian woman pull in in the handicapped spot in the front. She gets out with her mask on and was walking in. This has been several, several months ago. And she stops. She looks at me and says, is everything okay? I'm like, yes, ma'am. I said, I, I, I just got to wait for somebody to get here to jump me up. She goes, oh, no, I'd jump you. So she got in her car, <laughs> little tiny car. I'm thinking, oh, her car is not going to, not going to get this one started because my battery's in the trunk. It's not in the front, but you can jump it off from the front. And I'm thinking, man, she's probably not going to have enough power from that little tiny car to do it. Sure enough. And then she got back in, drove her car back around her spot, got in it, went in the car. And I was like, wow. <laughs> she didn't have to do that. She goes, no, sir, you don't need to be sitting here like that. So I drove the fleet and got a new battery. But I'm like, that was so not, I mean, just random. Random stuff that people do. And we don't realize... That probably blessed her more than it blessed me by her just doing that, you know, because she felt like she contributed and helped and did something. So a lot of people don't get that, you know, and, and it's just one of the, a lot of people are out for themselves. And that's where we got to look for all those. And it, it doesn't cost us to serve anything. So out of those seven blessings that Peter talks about, which one resonates most to you? Which one is you? Is it faith or virtue or is it knowledge? Is it temperance, patience, godliness? I mean, which one is, you could say, is probably yours right now that you you have the best of? Patience. Patience? That don't come easy. Sure, <laughs> Definitely not patience. Just ask Michelle. She <laughs> prayed for it and God gave her to me. So. I help her out. I was done lot. then. Huh? I was done then. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have one other than patience? Mm -mm. <laughs> I don't know if you wrote these down, but I put them down here for the seven blessings that um, that we get. Are they on your paper? Yes. Man, I did all that for nothing. 
<laughs> what about the five insights of love? Yep, they're on there too. Man. Oh, I did. I have something there. I want to read it. Hold on. Hold on. Looking at my notes that I have on there. Let me get to it real quick. I think once I read it, I'll realize why I did it. Second Corinthians 5, 14 and 15 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which should live, not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Basically saying, the reason we should be living is for Christ. Not for ourselves. That's who we live for, is Christ, because of what he did and what he what he done. So go right, stay right. So one side says, life is a journey, stay left. Life is a destination, exit a half mile, which is to your right. And that's where we're going towards, right? This was out of my, my book, out of the class that I'm in right now. Our spiritual formation comes within a corporate and a social context. Our growth towards wholeness in Christ is for the sake of others within the body of Christ, that we might nurture one another into the wholeness of Christ. Our growth towards wholeness is also for the sake of others beyond the body of Christ, that the redeeming, healing, transforming love of God may be known in a broken and a hurting world. Our spiritual formation is not about us. It's about others. It's all about others. Our journey to heaven is all about others. What are we doing to take others with us, to get them there as well? We're not in this race by ourselves. We gotta do it together. So here's a thought. We've been given everything that we need on this journey. What are you doing with it? What are you gonna do with it? Everything that we need, God has given it to us. Because this is what we're going for. We're wanting to make it home. So there's no way we can sit here and say, well, I can't do this. I can't do that. That's one thing I told my kids when, we were, when they were growing up, especially my son. I said, I better never hear that saying, I can't. And I made him as a kid memorize Philippians 4.13, Luke 1.37. There's no reason we should ever say those words out of our mouths, I can't. We can always do something for somebody. We can always pray. You, know, you might not be able to do this, you might not be able to go visit, you might not be able to help this one financially, you might not be able to help this one with something, but you can always pray. So we can always do something. And we just got to remember that. Don't forget, Saturday at 5 o'clock is our adult banquet. I hope you all are all planning on being here. I am looking forward to it. I hope you all show up and come and bring some nice little finger foods and desserts for us to eat. Because I'd like to try some things. <laughs> um, like I said, dress dress nice. I mean, no, I don't. Hopefully, no shorts or anything like that. But if you want to dress up, that's fine. If you want to wear an ugly sweater, that's fine. I was thinking about it until I saw that it was supposed to be back in the '80s. I said, I'm not wearing a sweater. <laughs> it's not going to happen because I'd have to get it cold in here. And then I'm going to hear everybody complain. It's so cold. It's so cold. <laughs> Cloudy here tonight. Yeah, really? I, I got yeah. there. Set at seventy four and hasn't even come on yet. Yeah, it has. Yeah, no, it has. Sitting right underneath it, it was blowing, freezing. I haven't apple. felt it yet, but but remember, if you if you want to participate in the gift exchange, that's fine. You don't have to, but if you want to, you're gonna have fun with it. I promise. The women always outdo the men because they, they're more than <laughs> us. So. Um, but that starts at five o'clock, so please come. It's 18 and older, so it's our adult banquet. Uh, so be much in prayer about that. Don't forget Sunday, we have the, the Keatmans. I think that's Ketamans. how you... Ketamans. Ketamans from Japan. They're American, but they're missionaries to Japan that we support as a church. Um, they will be here Sunday morning at 11, so please come. We'll take up a love offering for them as well to help them um, while they're here. So. Just be much in prayer about that. Remember each other in your prayers. Okay, because everybody's going through something and dealing with something. And around the holidays, some 
don't enjoy them as much as others, so we just got to pray for them. So, uh, all hearts and minds clear. Thank you all for being here. Lord, we want to thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. Lord, thank you for those that made it out tonight, Lord, and those that are watching online. Lord, we ask that you would help us to take these uh, elements that you put in your word, Lord, that show us that we have everything that we need in order to make it to heaven, but also so we can take others with us. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to use these in our lives and work on those areas that we know that we need to do better at. And Lord, we ask that you would bless us as we leave here tonight. Keep us safe as we go home. Lord, bring us back at the next appointed time. And I pray that when we have our adult banquet Saturday night, that you'll be here with us. You'll bless us with your appearance. Lord, I pray that you'll bless each and every one that'll be here. And Lord, we ask all of this in your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.